Hello everyone, welcome to the first discussion at the coffee table. Now I know you must be thinking that this doesn't really feel like a coffee table vibe or anything. It looks pretty executive. I know what you're thinking. Well, the set is still under renovation and trust me, when it comes up, you'll be the first one to see and you will absolutely love it the way we are in love with it right now. But you know, all good things need to be waited for so we are being patient about it. So what is this coffee table? Well, we thought that, you know, there are a lot of serious political discussion shows coming on air on a lot of channels and they're practically doing the same thing over and over again. So we just decided like we were actually sitting in a coffee shop and we were just thinking and then we got a receipt and we wrote on the back of it that, um, hey, why not come up with a show of our own? Let's call it <coughs> Coffee Table. Let's just talk about the interesting things that are happening around us, trending in politics or otherwise, and just talk about it like we would talk at any casual place, right? So let me introduce you to our to my guests at the coffee table, and then, I, then I'll introduce myself to you. So the first uh, friend who's joining me at the coffee table is FSJ. His actual name will forever remain a mystery. You will never know what FSJ stands for. And he has a lot of marketing and advertising experiences. Uh, and right now he's at LUMS. So thank you, FSJ, thank you. for agreeing to do what was written on the back of our receipt that day. I love coffee. <laughs> so that's what brings me here. Fair mm. enough, fair mm. enough. Thank you so much. And the second guy who's joining us, he is Dr. Nadimul Haq, a renowned economist. And one of my friends just told me to tell that he is a rare gem in the treasury of Pakistan. Oops. Now I have to. <laughs> big Excuse to the cheesiness. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the two guys that I was having coffee with that day. And then we decided to just go for it. But here is a catch to this they can never agree on a single point. So that is where I come in. I have to really like get these two under control and you know, get them to have a time out to calm down, to actually try to agree on something, but that is a long shot. Mm -hmm. So uh, FSJ, how do you feel about having the first discussion at a not so coffee table? I think uh, it's a question of uh, how you're thinking, right? The space matters and we're looking for our own space. We're looking for our own coffee shop where we can have uh, lots of people come in, have lots of conversations with us. It's going to be about conversations. Conversations lead uh, to a collision of ideas at times, to a sharing of ideas. That's what the coffee shop uh, is going to, uh, was actually all about, and that's what the coffee table is going to be all about. No, but hang, I, hang yeah. on. Every time See, I have coffee. I knew he would, I, he would not even let me <laughs> get to the end of the first sentence. Every time I have coffee <laughs> with my friends, we end up yelling at each other <laughs> and we never listen to each other. Yeah. Are you going to do that or not? Uh, no. No? No. We will Are you okay with that? Um, I'll just wait for it to get heated up. So <laughs> then I can It depends on the drama. brew of coffee also. Mm -hmm. Question of what coffee you've been drinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yelling comes from drinking instant coffee. No, wait, hang on. You tell me. Uh, <laughs> I agree. Instant coffee is the most terrible thing you'll ever drink but in But let your me life. ask you another. Are we going not to invite politicians? Um, Who? I only came here because of the politicians. No, no, even Don't those. Don't you want those guys? Even they're being served tea and biscuits, so he cannot have them over but, the but coffee I mean, table. <laughs> there's no television show that will sell without politicians. We have to have PTI. We have to have politics. We have to have politicians. But politics is about people, isn't it? But you don't want all three of them together so that they can fight with each other? We can take them into a coffee shop and they can slug it out. They can slug it out. Okay, okay, okay. I haven't introduced myself. Thank you for caring so much about me. Yeah. I didn't get to introduce myself. I forgot about that. Go ahead. So anyway, I am Fiza Jamal and I'm honored to actually sit with these two guys and have discussions. And uh, what have I done? I have a background in media and new media, and I also learned Chinese. So that's a little Brilliant. feather in my cap. So Chinese, yeah. you're talking about coffee, not tea. Chinese tea is also good. Well, you know, ironically, China has a lot of tea, a lot of coffee shops. Like everywhere, at every corner, you at least find a Starbucks. Really? In yeah. China? In China. There's a huge market. No, it's more I don't of a see any Starbucks in Pakistan. Why, why are there no Starbucks in Pakistan? I don't know. You tell me, Mr. Economist. Huh? How come there's no Starbucks But in there's Pakistan? Gloria Jeans, right? Yeah. Uh, do you go there often? Uh, not that often. Not that often. They're not paying me to say I go there I often. Go so I go to Gloria Jeans say. eavesdrop. You do? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I love going to Gloria Jeans or any of the other coffee shops. So what did you hear recently? Uh, lots of discussion, uh, lots of uh, expectation, lots of uh, exuberance. Do they like television? Uh, they hate television. 
Why? It's not their medium. You're talking about young people. Coffee shops, hate television. Coffee shops. Hmm. They're on their mobiles. They're hmm. hardly even conversing with each other. So they you sit in the mobile. You don't watch television. You don't watch all this yelling at night. Uh, no, not really. I rarely watch it. When I have no drama going on in my real life, I mm -hmm. just switch to the mm -hmm. <laughs> channels mm -hmm. to have some drama in my life, mm -hmm. you know, to feel okay. alive. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. So let, me, let me start with where mm. I first came across Dr. Mm. Yes, please, right. please. Mm. So we started our first conversation mm. on Twitter. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And we, I think three tweets in, we started to disagree on things. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So the next best logical s step was mm. to meet up in real life and yeah. disagree in real uh, terms. Yeah. Sit across each other mm. and question each other mm. and say, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Mm. So he loves asking questions, right, just as much as I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's conversations, mm -hmm. it leads to nothing at times, mm -hmm. but the satisfaction that you get out of having a conversation of uh, arguing. is really the reward. Mm -hmm. You uh, are satisfied with arguing. <laughs> argument, argument, conversations normally are arguments. True. Right? Con conversations are different point of view. True. So coffee shops, right? So when we started to talk about coffee shops, mm -hmm. so one of the first things that I learned from, uh, from Doc is that innovation in Europe started with the coffee shops. Hmm. About 300 years ago, prior to uh, coffee shops opening up uh, across uh, most of Europe, hmm. they used to be ale houses or beer houses. <coughs> and most of the people were always tipsy and drunk. Right? So productivity wasn't that high. And this is the kind of, you know, the uh, rising curve of the Industrial Revolution. Hmm. So coffee shops turned that around in the sense hmm. that now people were more anxious. Right? They had more anxiety. So oh, there would be yeah. more discussion, more uh, conversations, more uh, you know, sharing of ideas. Is that uh, really where it all uh, started from? He's going to disagree, isn't no, he? No, ultimately humanity loves to come together and talk about things, right? Yeah. But the problem is that we can talk about good things and bad things as well. Yeah. And so what happens is we get together in good places, we can have good discussions. But coffee shops can also be used to create anxiety. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, created the French Revolution. Yeah. Killed a number of people. Yeah. Ultimately, humanity is all about ideas. And unfortunately, I think here we've kind of lost touch with ideas, mm -hmm. haven't we? Because every evening we discuss what did so and so minister do yeah. in parliament? What did this? Why did this happen? Somebody said this, and we'll sit down and talk about it. And I find that somehow we are not really in that mode that Europe was in where they were questioning things, they were, they were discussing things. Mm -hmm. And I somehow feel that maybe we don't really enjoy questioning, do we? Well, uh, maybe we don't. Mm -hmm. uh, I think as children, mm -hmm. we are actually discouraged from asking questions. True, mm -hmm. true. School, that is ah, like don't blame question. your past, for God. All right, okay. <laughs> How can you go All, right. you just, all you're saying is my blame it on past. my parents. My, my blame it on my, my parents. I d I d you have to take responsibility for right. yourself, right? <laughs> okay, I, now I I'm mean, just wondering, you, how did I get stuck in this dynamic? <laughs> I shouldn't have been at that coffee I mean, this shop. business of my parents did it to me, which we all do. And the next thing you'll tell me now, America did it to us. That's why we are where we are. It has it? Right. What happened? Okay. Let's go. Let's go back but, to how. No, no, no. I'm not going to let him go on <laughs> this one. Yeah. What do you mean? What did they do? Next, we're going to say America did this. Of course, they've done this to us. What it's in the end I, I always it's the Jews who've done it. Yeah, exactly. So let's just trace it back no, to I'm, the Jews. No, it's no, going no, to get look, very controversial America, now. What did America do to us? We went and sat in their lap mm -hmm. in Seattle and Cento yeah. a long time ago. Yeah. We are willing to go and beg for aid every drop of a hat, just mm. like we went just now to Saudi Arabia. Mm. They said they'll give us three billion. We started doing Bhangra. Mm. And then they said, no, it's only one installment we're giving. I don't Guys, know whether they're giving you, anything gonna, or not, I'm gonna right? I'm going to put you off here. We are not getting too serious right now. It's no. like the first discussion we are having. Let's keep it. No, where is it serious? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just taking, I'm just taking him, I'm just taking him up on this. He's blaming his parents and that's not fair. <laughs> I mean, it's our fault that you know. I think you have been through something as a parent that you're saying. So you don't blame your parents, blame Uncle Sam directly. <laughs> right? Go to the. Then it's always that uncle yeah. who's yeah. the bad guy. It's the uncle, uncle who's done something. Right? something now, yeah. Saudi Arabia, we went to Saudi Arabia. Now we'll say, oh, we blame them for bringing fundamentalism here. Hmm. Why do we go begging? That's my only problem. So the issue is that, look, let's come back to the coffee shops, right? Okay, fair enough. Europe and everybody, coffee, but coffee, like everything else, all materials have a lot of history yeah. and very good history. For example, I was in Sri Lanka. I'll tell you a very fascinating story about coffee in Sri Lanka. Mm. Sri Lankans, you know, sorry, when the Brits came to Sri Lanka, like they came here, they found that we were all lazy, sleepy people, <laughs> not questioning, not doing anything. Mm. 
brand new so information. So what they did was they, they invited the Scottish people. Scots are very good entrepreneurs. So they invited the Scots to come to Sri Lanka. They sold them land in the middle of the Sri Lanka, which is hilly territory. They sold the land to them for like one guinea per acre. But you didn't have any passage with it. It was full of trees. It was a forested land. So these Scottish people had to come up mountain, first dig their way up, cut the trees, and then they decided what was best, plant coffee, because Europe was into coffee those days. Yeah. Yeah. So they decided to plant coffee. Six years, they had a very good crop. Then the crop went kaput. How come? Blight. Blight, disease. So what happens in Pakistan, this is important implications of Pakistan, remember that, Fiza. Mm. What happens in Pakistan, and you know this very well, right, Professor? The point is that these guys, whenever we have problem with our industry, what do they do? We look for uh, subsidies. They run to for, uncle. Uh, they run to they uncle. Run for uncle, help. uncle yeah, Pakistan, we uncle government, <laughs> right? We run and they to say, uncle. give us a subsidy, yeah. give us this, yeah. give us that, and yeah. they make it. Yeah. Now these Scots, being hardy people, they didn't run to the government. What did they do? Did this they is the actually crazy work? Part. <laughs> no, they actually, they, what they did was they cleared the place and they sent one guy to your home country, to China. Oh, it's my home country <laughs> yeah, so they, they sent I hope China is listening to this. <laughs> so You're they, my home country. So I love Pakistan. They sent somebody to China and they said, okay, we've heard of tea. So bring tea back. So the guy brought tea back, some tea plants. They planted the tea and they then had a tea crop. Waited six, seven years. Yeah. And they built a tea industry which is now flourishing out there 200 years later. But just imagine. Imagine the hardiness of the people. Imagine the ingenuity of yeah. the people that will go out and, and this is, I think, what we should have. You get into trouble, stand up on your own feet, right? Yeah, agreed, without yeah. a doubt. Yeah. So, uh, the question is, it's cultural also. It's, it's what you learn hmm. in your mother's lap more to say. No, Again, it, a reference to my parents. But it's, yeah. also, it's also literature, what we read. Yeah. Look, for example, let me bring you to this. My, my favorite subject. I'm in mourning these days. Hmm. Very simple. Stan Lee died. Yeah. You know who Stan Lee is? Yes, of course. Fiza, do you know who Stan Lee is? If I say no, will you judge me? Of course. <laughs> I know who he is. <laughs> so, okay, why do I bring up Stan Lee? Yeah. Why, why am I in mourning? We're talking about innovation, we're talking about imagination, we're talking mm. about creation, we're talking no, about but tell them storytelling. Who Stan Lee was. Fiza, tell them who Stan Lee was. So, so. Stan Lee is um, a wonderful, wonderful, mm. wonderful uh, creative person. He co-created Marvel mm -hmm. uh, and he mm -hmm. co-created a lot of superheroes that we are all familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, the Hulk, Spider-Man, Iron Man, um, mm -hmm. X-Men, you name them and they're all there. Mm -hmm. And it's just that he's idolized by so many people, young and old at the same time, that he is uh, like, he, you can say he saved their childhood. He saved their social inability to actually talk to other people. And he made a safe creative space for all of these uh, avid readers and creative people to just chill in, I would say. And she's telling us not to get serious. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I should have said it while smiling, no smiling. But I, I will say mm. that when mm. I heard of his death, I mm. was, you know, he's like one of those people that you just never imagined would die. Mm. So mm. when I heard his news, I was like, it's, it's impossible. Stanley cannot die. Like, uh, he has to have a cameo in the next Marvel yeah. movie, right? Who, who will come if he's not there? So I was in denial. I think like a lot of other people. But died at 94. But and a very full life and a wonderful life. Very full life, life but right? it could have been fuller. So what's your, what's your view on Stanley? My view on Stanley uh, is from what I... Uh, I, was in, I mean, of course, you know, I read comics. I love uh, the Marvel uh, universe. Mm -hmm. But my son, right, was the kind of uh, introduction point for me to Stan Lee. And we would go to see us a movie, right, that, a Marvel movie. And the high point of the movie was the Stan Lee cameo. Exactly. Right? And the word Excelsior, hmm. right? So we always said, what does it mean? You know, what is, why does he use this word? Yeah. Yeah, Excelsior. Hmm. So was it brilliant? But tell people what a cameo is first. I don't ah. know where, where many people okay, understand cameos, cameos. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock <coughs> used to do a cameo in mm. his own uh, mm. movies, which mm. means that you put yourself in the movie. Yeah. Right? So well, you do a small, little... Just a short yeah, few seconds. Very short... Uh, yeah, exactly. back, but everybody is looking for that cameo. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it becomes part of the whole movie experience. So no mm. Marvel movie was complete without a Stan Lee cameo. But and think about it another way. Mm. When I was young, coming back to your point about yeah. parents, yeah. Back my parents used to take my comics away. 
Hmm. My school teacher always and used to take my bad English. <laughs> bad English and it is teaching you all the wrong things in the world. Yeah, it's not sophisticated literature that you should it's be exposed Charles to. It's not Charles Dickens, it's not, you know, Jane Austen, hmm. it's not it's not all that stuff and some of the English was really really like hmm. short sentences, and, you know. But I, I used to always be told, hmm. don't read Marvel comics. You Simple. might get creative. Right. No, and the, that's very Good, very perceptive. <laughs> so the question is, we spent our life yeah. doing that. Yeah. But yet, at that stage, all it was a comic book. Yeah. Well, it was more than a comic book. It mm. was, uh, in reality, mm. I think this is one of the things you were talking about also. Mm. It's soft power. It's projection of soft power. Mm. Right? And if we go back to your point that our, our people have, they have like a limited thought process now because mm. we're exposed to a certain media, we're exposed to a certain... Mm. Mm. Uh, social circle now that mm. the brain is incapable mm. to go outside mm. the box. So these comics, in fact, Stan Lee as well, like he created a space, he created a medium through which you could think out of the box. You could think that, hey, there's a guy who can shoot webs out of his yeah. wrists. Hey, there's a guy who is from another planet altogether yeah. mm. and who is the, like a group of people yeah. with That's different surfer, superpowers. For example. Yeah. Right? Or Thor, who's a Greek god. He's a he Greek, came back exactly. to, you know, yeah. So, he actually made... But not a Greek god. You c didn't correct me. A what? Viking god. A Viking... I'm, I'm sorry. I was, oh, I was actually thinking in my own head about my point. <laughs> yeah. You can interrupt him, but please don't interrupt me. What have I done to you? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah. So, he made like this thinking out of the box thing very mainstream. Mm. And now even little kids go and watch his movies and enjoy as much as an adult. But do you know how Stanley started his career? No, mm. please tell mm. us. He started as <coughs> what was called an eraser. His job used to be to huh? erase the pencil marks. Yeah. Right? Because in initially, what? when the illustrators in used the to drawings. draw oh, a right. comic book, mm. Mm. so they would do it in pencil first mm. and then they would finalize it in felt pen. And then it was somebody's job to erase the pencil marks. So that's how he started, right? And then he came into his own by writing, by creating characters and that mm. took a quite a few years. Do you think that inspired him erasing the pencil marks? He's like, hey, I can do this better. Possible. So why not I draw my own? Possible. He didn't draw. He actually created the characters, right? Okay. So mm. his job or his role or his uh, contribution was creating those characters. It's always, stories don't have too many things different in them. Now it's you, about good and evil. You run an incubator. Yeah. And you are very fond of entrepreneurship. Yes, I am. Would you have funded Stan Lee? Would you a have? Very good question. 50 years right? ago? Uh, 60 50 years, years ago, ago uh, it would have been difficult, right, mm. to say, uh, well, you know, this guy's got potential and he's going to do something. We must understand where the comic was. So Captain America, right? Captain America was actually developed during the Second World mm. War yeah. mm. to raise money for the exactly. war effort. So they had to create a hero wearing the American flag. Also colors. a recruiting agent. Yeah, a re and to have that agent, feeling right? of yeah. patriotism. So there is a purpose to everything. Yeah. Right? And then out of that purpose grew a lot of other characters. Spider-Man is no longer just an American hero. No. Spider-Man is everybody's hero. Everybody. Right? Anywhere world. in the world. Mm -hmm. right? Whether, Including China, I would guess. Yeah. That there is a, a, a factor of heroism that mm -hmm. is universal. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that I think it introduced the concept about heroes in general. Then you would see movies mm -hmm. like James Bond and Born, you know, Born Legacy, yeah. Born Supremacy, mm -hmm. all of these. Mm -hmm. That it also says that heroes are not just for kids. They can turn into something that's for um, entertainment for all age groups. Mm -hmm. So would you think that he or maybe his co-creators and everybody, they inspired this feeling that I think they inspired a lot of things. It's heroes were not in all shades and forms. They were also diverse. Yeah. Like Storm is a black character. Yes. Like, you know, there was a Chinese character. There were all kinds. So he built this whole ethos of us coming together as humanity. Exactly. And every la last character, I think it was a character, Muslim character that was also yeah. introduced. Yeah. Yeah. But all these, like Black Panther, for example, is again in a set in a republic in Africa. In Africa. So the first time, you know, which has mineral wealth, right? Which has out of which vibranium. Exactly. exactly. What's the Wakanda? Now like? the important yeah. thing is that before this, Superman, etc., were always white. Yeah. And were always American, they owned by America, whatever. Stanley made it worldwide heroes. They came from everywhere. And they were owned by everybody. Yeah. They were just not America and they faced all kinds of criminals who were also worldwide, like take the X-Men, X-Men was a variety like a of things, right? So he was dealing with a minority issue in a way. Yes. He brought in women, women heroes, for example, were 
I know you'd love that, right? Women heroes, totally right? Into it. I mean, I grew, up, I grew up in an age where Superman was a male, and you know, hey, it was a male domain. Mm -hmm. He brought in women. So I, I must say, it was very creative. Yeah. Then the second thing he did, which was also very inspiring, was he put in a lot of science. Some of it yes. falls, some of it goes. So there's a physics to the comics yeah. also. And yeah. lots of people have written about the science of yeah. uh, Marvel comics, right? So he introduced There's a sense like of inclusion, actually. He like everybody feels a part yeah. of it. He interested us to science. Yeah. He challenged relativity, he challenged yeah. time travel, he challenged speed, he challenged everything. He went all the way out of the box. Um, exactly. <laughs> but that's very important. And then, the most importantly, for 50 years he kept doing it subscriptions I think it was a small time business yeah probably an SME as you call yeah. it yes. and then it exploded but right. today yeah. I think it's probably sold a hundred billion dollars yeah. worth of comics yes. of all. Absolutely. I mean well, it's movies and yeah. things yeah gone very big so I think it's it, it's illustrates entrepreneurship at its best yeah. okay it I want it to does. I want so to talk about one thing here yeah. that uh, Bill mm. Bill Maher is um, you know, he's a... Oh, Bill Maher. Yeah, Bill Maher. Small-time comedian. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, he actually had a post and it's actually, like, we're all admiring Stan Lee and really mourning mm. over the death of a creative genius. Mm. But here's something that he had to say, and I read it just a Please, while ago, that he threw shade at him by, on him by saying that he created, the guy who created Spider-Man and Hulk has died and America is in mourning. Deep mourning for a man who inspired millions to, I don't know, watch a movie, I guess. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Someone on Reddit posted, I'm so incredibly grateful I lived in a world that included Stanley. Personally, I'm grateful I lived in a world that included oxygen and trees, but to each his own, unquote. So there's also another thought process going on here that why do you care so much that Stanley has died? What are you losing? Because he defined uh, a lot of things, right? So that. Yes, oxygen is good, we need it, we need water, we need food also, we need uh, shelter, mm. all those things. But more than anything else, we need to dream. Exactly. Right? We are a species that dreams and gets other people to buy into that dream. That's what Stan Lee did for us. He dreamt, he imagined, he created. He had a right? creative so escape those, to the reality. All those factors are very important factors. They're part of living. So what do you think? Are trees and oxygen more important? <laughs> I would say stop following Bill Maher. <laughs> Bill Maher is a, he, he wants attention. Ooh. Remember he also said something very, very derogatory about Pakistan. Uh, can he you also, please remind us? He also said something like Pakistan is, you know, he referred to us in a very derogatory fashion and he said it's a, some country, some kind of a dangerous country, it should be whatever, destroyed or some, some, I think. I don't remember the exact remarks, but very derogatory. He's, he's obviously he's got a show to sell like our anchors and they make money off that and fair enough mm. uh, good thing the reason i think stanley is so interesting is that i think innovation everywhere is what drives an economy mm. right and unfortunately and, and he's working directly in the area yeah. to create innovation and innovation can happen anywhere innovation is stanley making comics and going global and now there's not a single person in the world who doesn't know Spider-Man is exactly. or Iron Man is. Or the Kids want to dress up as know. them in yeah. on Halloween. And it's a very, very important industry. At the same time, he's created a whole generation of Americans who are interested in science and doing crazy yeah. things. Sec lastly, he has rewarded craziness. Hmm. You can be Spider-Man. You can yeah. be a poor kid and you can dream of being Spider-Man. You can do whatever you like. And I think that's a phenomenal thing for somebody to have achieved in their lifetime. But we haven't, unfortunately, um, we haven't understood that. For example, why don't we have a Stan Lee in Pakistan? Why don't we have Actually, somebody uh, who's spinning tails like that? Yeah. We did. Amir Hamza was like that. Yeah. We did. We had Dastane, whatever. You know, we had all these things. But now we don't. Okay, so... Um it was, um, let's just say, instead of giving everybody else a break, I'm giving your neck a break because you're looking here and there at the same <laughs> time. Again, we don't have the set ready yet. Mm -hmm. So let's take a quick break and come back with a hot new topic. Welcome back to our coffee table, or should I say not so coffee table, because as I said, the set is still under preparation and soon it will be ready and we'll move back to our actual coffee table. This has a little executive look to it, but this is also a very pretty set for the other shows that we are having on Indus News. So just during the break, FSJ, uh, you were telling me about uh, 
a really cool story about how coffee came into being. It's yeah. more of a legend, if I may say. Yeah, there are legends because unless it's documented, written down by somebody somewhere and it has more than one source, so we consider it to be a legend. It's about a shepherd, an Ethiopian shepherd, who actually saw his goats getting very agitated or active or hyperactive once they ate a particular berry, a bush. Mm -hmm. There was a berry uh, that was growing uh, in that area. And he, as human beings are very, very curious, he thought, you know, he should also see what it's all about. So he had a few of those berries and he couldn't really sleep after that. So that's when uh, he started to pick those berries, bring them home and he started consuming himself. Do you know exactly. the name of this berry? Uh, <laughs> like if somebody wants to try it. I guess it's coffee berry. <laughs> coffee, coffee berry. Coffee berry. <laughs> so I'm sure it has a botanic name also, yeah. which most of us will never be able to pronounce. But that's how it uh, really started. And then from Ethiopia, because trading used to happen yeah. across uh, Arabia. So the coffee plant arrived yeah. in uh, Yemen. Right? And the Sufis right, uh, would brew coffee in the evening uh, before sleeping at night. Because they wanted to stay up, they wanted to, you know, have more discourse, they wanted to discover more. Mm -hmm. And that is where, uh, that is how then coffee started to spread across uh, most of Arabia. And when the uh, Abbasids uh, came, you know, during their caliphate, they started to export it to other areas, but kept control of the coffee plant. And, and uh, do you know that, that the first coffee shop was opened in Oxford in 1652? Yep. So, so it, it goes back to that long. It goes back a long, yeah. long way. Right? So I'm just thinking about that guy who just saw this berry and went like, hey, I should try it. What if it was poisonous? What if, what if it then, was? We wouldn't have had coffee today. So should we so, thank his uh, intelligence or thank his stupidity? What I think we, uh, we should thank his, uh, his nature to explore. And that's what <laughs> shepherds do. Naivety, they're the, maybe. They're out in the open. They're uh, navigating by the stars. They're under the starry sky, they're probably more intrepid than most of us. <laughs> they take risks. So th that's how, and lots of things happen that way. Lots of things happen because somebody takes a risk, right, and decides to discover something. So Discovery doesn't come without uh, sure. taking risks. Uh, Dr. Nadeem, can you think of uh, some things that just happened by accident? Oh, everything like happened. Somebody by took a risk and everything it just happened. Everything happened by accident. Can you name everything? For example, penicillin. <laughs> Right? Yeah. He was discovered by accident. He was looking at molds and he didn't know what molds could do. He discovered by accident that penicillin uh, happened. Almost everything happened by accident. When you look at any discovery, we can uh, outline tons of things. And the importantly, people experimented with everything. People experimented there. For example, take wheat. You can't eat n uh, natural wheat. We experimented with wheat a lot and that's when we began to eat wheat hmm. or chickens. Chickens, you know, are a derivative out of wild chickens or buffaloes. It's so like most of these things we created through discovery and experimentation. It's like the, it's like, you know, this discussion goes like, it's like the guy who first saw an egg and went like, hey, hmm. what happens if I eat it? Or yeah. when he saw a cow and he's like, hey, it gives, it's giving me this milk. What happens if I drink it? Yeah. Something yeah. so crazy that you wouldn't think of doing and it turns out to be good for you. But now I'm thinking in this day and age, mm -hmm. what is something, something so crazy mm -hmm. that somebody would do and it would become successful? Because I feel like now we have researched into so many things. We have expanded the horizons mm -hmm. in, in innovation and technology so much that mm -hmm. is it still possible to discover something The by next accident? thing that's happening, prepare yourself for it because okay. you guys will do it, which is to eat cockroaches, and insects. The, the Far Easterners have already started doing it and this is the next growth industry because to feed a population of 10, 12 billion we will have to look for other sources. But cockroaches are already being eaten yeah. in yeah. my home country apparently. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so, so I, I don't know, have you tried them? Um, if I say, Would if I confess them? anything on air I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> but the point is no you don't have to and you shouldn't. But yeah. the point is that is the next frontier. And people are beginning to experiment on how to eat things like that. And humanity is full of this thing. And we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be scared of that at all. But I've heard that a cockroach, I've heard that a cockroach tastes like um, fried chicken. Yeah, that's what <laughs> they say. So if it is becoming mainstream. <laughs> that's what they say. And they say it's full of protein. So it's uh, actually yeah. good for you. I mean, medically, that's what's been proven. Chicken but is also must, full of protein. I must uh, say that. I remember uh, mm -hmm. growing up as a child, and it is very rare that you would have a swarm of locusts. 
yeah. which is not a good thing because mm. locusts will go and decimate mm. yeah. any uh, any any place uh, mm. because they're just in such mm. sheer big numbers. But mm. I do remember that mm. uh, the very rare occasion, I think it was just possibly once, mm. but we did catch them and we did roast them and we did eat them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Right? So that's, uh, that's, that's it's normal. nothing unusual. No, people experiment with food all the yeah, time yeah. and people experiment with uh, you know, many things, for example, even sim simple things like, um, you know, going out and hunting. I mean, that's what people did for a long time, right? True. And what did we eat? I mean, now we think we're very pure and we ate things that are proper. But in the old days, our ancestors, I don't know what they ate. So talking about accidents and trial and error, mm -hmm. I want to talk about how the 100 days of um, PTI are almost what? over. Uh, yeah, I know, right? The discussion Politics? goes... How did we? How did we get to 100 <laughs> days? I mean, from, 100 days. from cockroaches <laughs> and crickets to 100 days. You are, days of PTI. You are. So you think uh, your show will not get ratings? That's why you're coming back to 100 <laughs> yeah. days. Well, right? you know, it is the first discussion, so it's this is also a trial and error at the. The fear so what of ratings. Set so, what you, not our set so please tell to, me what do you want to know about the 100 days. Well, I want to talk about because, again, accidents and trial and error. Yeah. Like the current government is getting this notoriety that they decide on one thing. And then they decide, oh, oh, it's not working for us. Oh, this experiment, rather, has failed. Let's take a U-turn and come back. Like, U-turn and this government have been Excuse associated. Excuse me, that's called learning. Yeah. So if they're learning, what's wrong with that? Right? I, uh, do you, what if, we, you, if you find yeah. that something's going wrong, do you take a U-turn or do you keep doing no, the no, same you thing? Keep, you, you change around. You, don't, you can't expect the same thing. If it's not working, it's not working. So right? to continue doing it, where are you going to get to? You're not going to get anywhere. So there are different perspectives on saying... So let the poor guy make mistakes. If I make a mistake, should I perpetuate it? Should I continue it? Should I build on it? Should I get, let it deepen? Or do I rethink and mm. do I recalibrate and mm. do I take another direction and try to achieve the same thing? So do you think... But what's so important about the 100 days in your view? I, in my view, uh, I don't think we, we should... I think it's rhetorical. It's more rhetorical than anything else. I think it comes out of American television. Yeah, it does. Right? It does. Because they think they have to You're sell something. You're bringing Uncle Sam in this yeah. conversation All again. They're saying, they're saying it's a hundred days. They say that out there, right? Because, hey, they have to sell television and they have to sell media. So I think we are just copying them. That's all. Otherwise, what's, what's, so what's your question? You lay down a milestone and you, mm. uh, you, you hang things around it and you start a discussion mm. and you start building into it and saying, okay, what's happened in the first 100 days and what were you expecting to happen yeah. in the first 100 days? One thing that Imran Khan, uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan, has repeatedly said mm. that he wants to help the poor of the country. He wants to bring them to mm. a respectable status where they have enough jobs and enough resources to have a respectable life. So, um, do you think that the Prime Minister uh, having the role as a philanthropist is being su is successful up till now? I think the whole purpose of politics should be people rather than uh, the politician himself or uh, rather than you know what you want it's about being able to give people what they want about delivering on the social contract mm -hmm. now talking about the 100 days again right there's a little uh, mm -hmm. discussion that took place at the Brookings Institute in Washington mm -hmm. so let's ask a Washington boy right? mm -hmm. Dr. Huck has been in Washington uh, <laughs> Washington second boy. home to him. <laughs> mm. right, so what does a think tank really do and what is a think tank's real purpose? And what the, is this discussion about? Because mm, I shared it. Mm. The so interesting thing is this discussion that happened at Brookings mm. where, um, you know, a Pakistani Bruce and mm. Bruce Rydell, mm. they got together to discuss Pakistan. Now I know this happens in Pakistan all the time and it's always the same old people, Bruce Rydell or some people, I won't name others, but it's very interesting to see who Bruce, Bruce Rydell is. He yeah. is a former CIA agent. Yes. He has made a career of Pakistan watching and he talks about Pakistan from a very American point of view. And these think tanks always put in a Pakistani and somebody else. Mm -hmm. But the discussion always is, they call it an Imran first hundred days, but the discussion was much more in Afghanistan and how Pakistan is not letting America get out of Afghanistan. They have one agenda and these think tanks follow the American State Department line. The tragedy is, as we discussed in the earlier segment, Stanley is America's soft power. We didn't cover that. Stanley yeah. sold America to the world. The whole world bought into Stanley. The fantasy We world. all go and watch, watch that. So we get, we, through subliminal messages, we develop a sympathy for America. We think America is the home of um, Spider-Man, Avengers. So it creates a kind of yeah. a warm, fuzzy feeling with 
We can relate to Spider-Man. Now, if China or somebody else had a superhero, we could relate to it, but we, we don't really uh, relate to that very well. So now the question is that that's a soft power. Now, the think tanks of America also are a soft part of America's soft power. They have a ton of think tanks who are always holding these discussions, putting them out in the media, and all our people think that, hey, real wisdom is coming from there. Even if it's gender-driven, we think it's wisdom coming from there. Now, the tragedy, Faisal, is yeah. we do not have think tanks in Pakistan. Why not? Zero. Why not? But, but it's why? not that we lack intellectual capital, do we? We do. How? My, my question about 100 days of PTI is oh, still just hanging still there. there. You're still there. No, no, okay. Hang on, hang okay. on, hang on. Okay, let her, let her go to her question so, then we'll take it up. Um, oh. As I said, like he, he recently to. tweeted that mm -hmm. uh, he has uh, laid the foundation of five more shelters mm -hmm. and their shelter in Lahore is complete and because there was a photo viral of a homeless family sleeping on the side of a mm -hmm. footpath that went viral on, in Lahore. Do you remember that? Have you seen that? So after that, Imran Khan was like, he noticed it and then he was like, okay, I've built the shelters so the homeless can find a respectable place to stay at. Mm -hmm. So, and he also uh, built the first ever free hospital for cancer cure named after his mm -hmm. mother, right? Mm -hmm. Shakat Khanum. So how do you think like at this point of time in Pakistan when the poverty is, uh, the poverty line is like below 60%, do you think we need a prime minister who's that sensitive and who's that empathic? All democratic prime ministers want to um, do something with the poor. They want to do something good that makes them look good because they want to climb up in the polls. But I, I, um, I think quite frankly, building shelters is something good politics, very good, There's nothing wrong with that. But let's look at the reality. Pakistan has very few homeless people. Uh, they may live in extended family setups. They may not have very good housing, so it doesn't matter. Imran's uh, slogans are correct that he wants to build 5 million houses, he yeah. wants to have 10 million employment. The slogans are all there and I'm all for them and I love them. But, but the problem is how do you deliver? And that's where we have to come down. 100 days is too early. It's the too question early. that we can discuss in 100 days is are this, has he set the right direction or not? And that's we can discuss. But otherwise, mm. I don't want to hold him responsible for not delivering in 100 days. The agenda that he has will take years. Yeah, FSJ, uh, do you have to weigh in on this? Yeah, uh, my perspective is that these are, like I said, these are rhetorical slogans mm. and these are rhetorical milestones also. Mm. Uh, realistically speaking, what can we expect in a hundred days? Mm. Even if we talk about uh, all kinds of uh, mm. policy or policy definitions, even that would take longer than a hundred days. Unfortunately, in our politics, we do not have the kind of maturity that we mm. expect where you would have a shadow cabinet, you'd have a shadow government, you'd have a lot of uh, research, you'd have mm. people prepared mm. right, to step into government and start uh, to run <laughs> right, uh, from day one. It's just not possible. Mm -hmm. When you get into government, right, you start to discover a lot of things. You start to find out that there are all kinds of strictures. You suddenly find out that you may not want VIP culture, mm. but there's something called the blue book, which says you can't step out of your uh, office or you can't step out of your home without certain uh, things happening, mm. whether it's in the name of security, protocol or whatever. Mm. So we must contextualize it in that manner and say, what does it really mean? I love how this set has, <laughs> this ha set has such an influence on us that we have turned into a very serious <laughs> political yes, show for some yes. reason. We're no experts. We're just discussing what we are seeing and what you're seeing. So, uh, <laughs> so continuing on like with this conversation, um, there was recently a, a huge because scandal. Because you put us in a position. I know, it's the Like the rest I of the television you. shows, yeah. it's that we have to react to something that is just not happening. We have to cook up a story. Yeah. The point it's is, look. missing the casual the, vibe of a coffee mug the and a coffee set. Day <laughs> agenda, the 100 day thing is a contrived issue. Imran has the right direction. He's thinking about the right things to do. But the question is, how can he do it, right? The biggest problem right now is that he has no delivery mechanisms. He has no freedom to do things because we have to be a short of money. We are in mm. a fiscal crisis. And then the second thing is, I think quite frankly, it goes back to what you were discussing earlier, the think tanks. We have no real think tanks. He has no backup intellectually. A, minute, a prime minister can only come in and say, hey, help the poor make things work. But somebody has to provide him with ideas. And unfortunately, because we have for 70 years, or maybe a thousand years, because we stopped thinking 
way back in the 12th century, Muslim stopped thinking, I should say. So, so he tried to wake us up, we didn't wake up. So right now there are no thoughts on the table. There are no ideas on the table. There are only these television shows where people think they know something. And the politicians think they know something. But they don't know anything except mm. that, hey, I want to give the poor something. You can't give the poor anything. You have to make things happen. Do you think that the best, that's the, that uh, helping out the poor is the best card to play in a democratic country? Of course, always. You are, in a way, governing in their name. Right? Yeah. Who are you? You're nobody. So You're the chief executive of the country because people although chose sorry, you. Although sorry, sorry, although sorry. Hmm. I think now you're trying to slide one over. Am I? Yeah. <laughs> Look, the point is, you're the beneficiary like me, mm -hmm. like Fiza, mm -hmm. of I'm the system poor, yes. where everything is for the rich. Sure. And then all we do is sing yeah, praises, about the poor. sing yeah. praises to the poor. So yeah. Democrats, are, even in the U.S., they're always fooling the poor into voting for them. Very little is done for the poor, and very little will be done for the poor. But Pakistan is a poor country, you know, a lot of people is it? here. Not yeah. really. Yeah. I mean, the rich are extremely rich. You would find them going to nice, fancy restaurants, mm. but that is only a small percentage of our population. Mm. So when uh, PTI is repeatedly saying that we're going to do this for the poor, mm. do this for the poor, does this put Pakistan in a small box of poverty that the international image of Pakistan also goes as a very poor country? Not, a, not really. I mean, mm. we do have problems. When we say it's a poor country, right, we measure it in the form of GDP per capita, mm -hmm. right, the debt uh, Even that, that you've is accumulated. not so much. The debt is, right? debt so is too it's much. Not that, it's not that big. Right? There's one context saying it's too big. The other context mm -hmm. is you know, have 200, uh, plus, uh, 200 million plus people. Mm -hmm. It's really not that big. Right? So there's another way of looking at it. And is, the question is what direction do we set from here? Right? Do we have a way forward? Right? I must uh, refer to Doc's book then, hmm. right? and he says that Pakistan will become a nation tiger if it does a few things right. And what are those few things? Hmm. So one is political reform right? and saying, why do we not question right, what needs to happen with our constitution? But Faisal, hmm. the, um, I would like to put it slightly differently. I think nobody is rich or poor. Yeah. All we are is idea poor. I, I don't understand this. Okay. Our people yeah. are poor people. Mm -hmm. You've seen this. I think you've seen this too. When they leave this country, they leave in a container. Yeah. They smuggle themselves yeah. in. They do all kinds of crazy. You know that. I don't yeah. need to spend, sure. spill that out to you. No. They'll take a boat. They'll smuggle them in. They'll pay an agent. When they go there, they make a lot of money. Yeah. Do they, they have the opportunity, so they make opportunity a money. Opportunity is the key. I right? watched a documentary yeah. recently about yeah. the same thing that people yeah. mm. are smuggled to Europe yeah. uh, and uh, America and Canada. Mm. But over there, they just end up selling flowers to people on the streets. And uh, What's wrong with that? There's nothing what? wrong with selling flowers uh, on the streets. But street. then they have this name. I don't know if I can say it right yeah. now, but I have a few friends from there. Mm. And mm. when they met me first, they were like, Oh, you're from Pakistan, mm. you're speaking good English, you look educated, mm. you, uh, you are going to a university, but this is not how we're used to Pakistanis. We're used to them doing small time That's jobs. That's because we do our own propaganda badly. Yeah. We go out and See, tell everybody we are poor. Our Prime Minister goes and says we are in shambles. Everybody says, all your media, every television program says that we steal taxes, we don't pay taxes. Everybody, just like you said, 60% poverty, although it isn't, although it's much less. But the point is we oversell ourselves as being dumb and, and whatever. But the key thing is that our people, I've seen uh, uneducated people somewhere in the U.S., they have three or four McDonald's. Yeah, absolutely. They have five or six, seven But they're, 11s, also, they're right? also janitors and they, taxi of course they drivers. Are. And yeah. Yes. So I don't think even our people who have lack of opportunities here, mm -hmm. I won't say that they're also at, I don't know who is at fault. In fact, Immigr I don't want to play, play a blame game, but. Always have a purpose, right? Yeah. Why do you leave your home? Yeah. You leave your home because you want to build a better life, right? right? And you believe that you're going to another shore where you will have more opportunity. So why not become a janitor in Pakistan? Why do you have to go abroad and become a janitor? Because a janitor in Pakistan makes maybe 200 rupees a day. Out there, the janitor is making what, 100 pounds a day. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, a big difference, right? There's a big difference. And these same janitors, I've seen, that some of them will save money and buy a property and probably has a property on rent. So if they have a property on rent, they become wealthy. 
right? But in that documentary yes. that I watched, I was telling you about, they were living under tunnels, they were living in slums, they were in really bad conditions. Tina, you watch Bill Mahar and you watch such documentary. <laughs> this documentary is actually made by a Mahar. Pakistani. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so they were like, we regret the, leaving that's not, Pakistan. That's not the real story. That's not the real story. Right? Go to Jackson Heights and you will see Pakistan. And this I'm talking about, let's say, Queens and New York. Right? You're talking about a particular area mm. where they are the most affluent Pakistanis. But they have shops, they have restaurants, <coughs> they run businesses. They're doing all, kind, all kinds of uh, stuff. But there's another little thing that we have to consider. Yeah. We must think in terms of averages or we must think in terms of you know not everybody's obviously going to do well yeah. nowhere in the world sure. everybody does well so you're absolutely right there'll be an underclass but I'm saying a large number of them do make it we're also but doctors and engineers yeah. abroad not only doctors like 20 billion dollars coming in in remittances yeah. yes. That's even, right. even taxi drivers for example when they save money they buy a property hey that's a lot of achievement mm. and I met some taxi drivers over there I met a guy who's, who's a gardener for example yeah. He's a gardener, he works in somebody's house. Hmm. But he told me he's got three properties. Yeah. His one son has become a doctor, another daughter has become gardener, something else. Now he's a wealthy person and he's made it in life. From a gardener, he's made it in life. Hmm. And so I think we must take that into account. Yes, that's happening. So our people have that ability. The problem is that back home here, we have a political problem, a deep-rooted political problem that I hope Imran will fix. We have a deep-rooted capacity problem. We have a deep-rooted idea problem. And Imran is hitting at those issues through his speeches, but he still hasn't figured out the foundations of the problem, the core of the problem. He has, still hasn't figured out how to go there. Yeah. And I don't fault him for that. I fault us for that because our universities are not thinking. Yeah. Our think tanks are not there. There's no thinking spaces exactly. in Pakistan. So and most important of all, no thinking discussion is taking place at coffee tables. But coffee table, <laughs> we're, it's, it's a first discussion, so I yeah. think we should give ourselves a leverage and see how much we can work with I think right conceptually now. What, so uh, what so again, we have to give ourselves leverage, right? Yeah, we yeah, have yeah. To give give, give everybody room, right? a leverage here. Conceptually, <laughs> yes. the coffee table is yes. nothing more than a space, yeah. yes. right? Where you sit and you share and you at times you disagree ready to learn. Hmm. and at times you learn, at times you teach. Hmm. So all that has to happen. Yeah. True. Right? That is where I think uh, the constant uh, refrain and the discussion and saying we are poor in ideas, we are not poor in anything else. Hmm. We have a very young population which means yes. people who will be able to take greater risks. Hmm. They can take more risk also. Right? There is a different perspective. We are more comfortable with technology also. So the technology comfort is another mm. uh, factor mm. that Pakistan has a lot of. Yep. Right? So, I mean, just to share with you, somewhere around 2011, right, I was uh, working with an organization and we were looking at uh, SMS traffic. Mm. Pakistan was number four in the world in SMS traffic. Mm -hmm. We have right? so and much time. time, we are always sitting around a coffee table yeah, but, sending texts. But text at that time, you could not render Urdu on your mobile phone. But there's a problem. Mm. These kids are sitting around coffee tables sending SMSs. Yes. So I want to ask Fiza. Yeah. Oh my God, I'm being asked a now, question. Now, uh, please tell us, what yes. do you kids think? How are you helping Imran? You elected him. <laughs> How are you going to help him? How are you coming out with ideas on your coffee tables for Imran to take? Well, uh, if I talk about like us on social media, we're just blindly, you know, supporting him in whatever he does. If, mm -hmm. if anybody says he's taking a U-turn or this, uh, mm -hmm. we're like, no, he's not taking a U-turn. Mm -hmm. We talk like you that mm -hmm. he's learning from his, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. let's say mistakes or mm -hmm. let's just say poorly made decisions. Mm -hmm. So we're just blindly supporting him because as of this moment, um, some younger generation, they don't see fit anybody else who can run the country so what do right you guys now want? as Imran What do you guys want? We want... We well, are ready to pass the baton <laughs> on to you. I'm going what, to do say, you guys, what do you guys want? I'm going to say something that might feel like I'm dumbing down the discussion, but we Please want dumb jobs. It down. We want jobs and I remember seeing a meme recently. It said that, oh, start dusting off your degrees because now Imran Khan is coming and mm -hmm. you will need your degree for the job. So, mm -hmm. I actually just butchered the meme, but yeah, that's what it so, said. So, so you, we you, want equal you opportunities. Want jobs. We right. want opportunities. No, but hang on, hang on. What does a job mean to you? We want opportunities to build ourselves, to yeah. grow and become successful and responsible responsible citizens of Pakistan. Pastor, what does a job mean in Pakistan? A job means uh, I get food on the table. Hmm. And a is, roof over my that head. That is really what it's all about. No, normally because these are, we live in larger uh, family groups, we live in, uh, you know... Uh, Can I ask you a question? Food on the table is fine. Hmm. But what do you do to get that food on the table? 
you go through a process of uh, education, right? Mm -hmm. Supposedly, and you get a degree, mm -hmm. and that degree Dr. then qualifies Nadeem, you to go look for a job. Dr. Nadeem is looking for a specific answer. Let me tell you. Why don't you answer I'll it? I'll answer it just now. I was coming on a flight, PIA flight, small plane, those. Yeah. XTR, it, what yeah, do you yeah. call it? Yeah, ATR. ATR. ATR, right? The notorious ATR. The, the notorious. <laughs> now, when I fly in that kind of a plane in the US, yeah. there's only one steward or stewardess and one pilot. Yeah, yeah. Crew Over of two. You have three, yeah? No, hmm. six. Six? Oh, in this small ATR? Yeah. I've never counted them. So, before. you should count them next time, <laughs> right? Another thing, okay? In a government office now, people, everybody wants a government job. Recently, they announced a job for a peon in the high, high court. And I was told they had 100,000 applications, some yeah. MAs and MPhils. Why do they want that job? Why? Because you work from 10 to 2. Yeah, and then you go do something else. Right? Now, where do you, I mean, in most of the public sector, the office is empty at 2 o'clock, and they come in at 10 o'clock. So, is that the kind of a job you want? Because I think quite a few people want that job. I think the job. future of work is another discussion. I would just love to work for just half no, an hour and just be we'll done with it. We'll get to that. <laughs> right now, let's get to the work here. Yeah. I'll ask you another question. Yeah. When is there a rush hour in Pakistan? Uh, rush hour is supposed to be, mm. right, uh, 8 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to be 5 in the evening. Do you agree with that? Uh, Next time what we'll do is, yeah. we'll call in a driver an Uber driver or something, I'll sure. talk to them. Sure. And they tell me if I was just you're thinking wrong. about that job of 10 to 2 and I'm just still dreaming about that job See? of 10 to 2. So, so the Uber driver, the Kareem driver tells me that rush hour is at 9 in the morning mm. and 2 in the afternoon. Yeah, 2 it's in the, the afternoon schools. is a different. Yeah, it's for schools. That, is, uh, right? that I agree. But in, they say that there is no evening rush hour because we don't work 9 to 5. Okay. So we work shorter hours. So? So why do you expect to be productive? Tell me something. Why do you expect to okay. be growing? Okay, okay yeah. guys, I think uh, we should uh, stop here. We okay. have more episodes to come, more okay. trial, uh, trial and error to learn from. Uh, so in today's but just when the conversation is heating up, in yes, today's I know. <laughs> <laughs> in today's first discussion, we uh, went through a lot of things. Our conversation, as you might have also felt, went from here to there to mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So that is the basic concept of coffee table. And yes, I'll be laughing most of the time, so please bear with me. <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. so we'll see you again on Sunday. So stay with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm.